football. I didn't want to do nine hours of it because we got game after game after game. So we will do that. Plus, uh, for my purposes, this deserves it. And it needs to be there. And I need to say something. And uh, and it's about time I did, you know, on the record. I mean, uh, from, from a standpoint of how I feel. And I've actually, with, and I know it's a New York story. I get that to a degree. To a degree, it's a New York story. Um, but uh, I've actually been sad the last uh, six, seven days is the best way to explain it. Uh, because this is my old uh, partner's last day, at least right now, officially, on a radio station that he got to back in, you know, the late 80s, 1987, uh, where he began. And then, of course, a year and a half, two years later, the beginning of Mike and the Mad Dog on uh, September day in 1989. No need to chronicle all that. You've read it. You've seen it if you're interested. So there's no need to get into it. But... It's a sad day for me because it almost feels like if Mike goes, I should go too. I mean, it's kind of weird. You know, we came in kind of together, although Mike started there at CBS. I started somewhere else, but I was in a different form than Mike was. But we sort of came in together. Maybe it's time to go out together. No, I don't feel quite that way. Mike's a little older than me. Uh, but after 30 years, and, you know, he did three decades worth of sports talk. And the last decade when I wasn't there, which was a very difficult decade because I left a, you know, a very solid radio station with great ratings, and Mike had to keep it going. I came over here. I had my own job. I had my own assignment to do, and my own job to do, and sort of see with a lot of help. And we've had a lot of help, whether it's the bosses upstairs, uh, Greenstein and Moss and Meyer, whether it's Steve Torrey, whoever it might be, Steve Cohen. You know, we had to try to build a little channel here for us and sort of have a little lasting impact. So, but I did it incognito. Mike did not do that. Uh, Mike Francesa, when I left on a August day of 2008, what he had in front of him was competition, number one. And number two, he lost one half of, very, of a very popular sports talk duo, and he had to figure out a way to, you know, either replace it or pick up the pieces and get ratings and make sure the advertisers stayed, do all those kinds of things. And that is very, very, very difficult. I used to think at the time that me leaving, I had the harder assignment than Mike would and since in the last eight, nine years, ten years, I have thought the other way because this is such a good place to work and they gave me plenty of room. I mean, what are they going to do, fire me? They were. They gave me a long-term contract. As long as I went on the radio and did my thing, I was okay. Uh, so from that perspective, I think when you look at it and the fact that he had the report card and I did not, I think Mike probably had a tougher assignment than I did. And listen, nobody knows. Uh, nobody not his, not his wife, Roe, uh, not his, not anybody, um, you know, not his brothers. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Well, no, probably not. Uh, you know, not his mom, who I knew very, very well. Um, I don't think, and I don't think anybody, not producers, uh, we had a million of them. I don't think anybody, anybody, literally, knows each other. Mike knows me better than my wife and my family does, and I know Mike better than his family and his kids do. As simple as that. I spent tw I spent two decades with him, five hours a day, five days a week, sometimes longer, five and a half hours for, you know, literally 20 years, 19 and a half, 20 years. So him leaving today, departing, is a is, is a very weird feeling. Because it almost feels like half my life is being left too. It almost feels like, you know, boy, Mike's leaving, maybe it's time, uh, I guess half of me is dead. I mean, it's like half of my career is sort of in a vault. This is the other half of the career. And 30 years, and say what you want. And we all know, and we can go through this a thousand times, and I'll be the first to, you know, tell you there's some truth to, you know, Mike's issues, and there's some things that aren't fair. I can go through it all you want, and we can sit there, and everybody's got foibles. I got plenty of them, too. We can go through that a thousand times. Here's the bottom line. And this is where Phil Mushnick, who is a clown, uh, he didn't acknowledge it, and he should have. New York Post. Uh, here's the bottom line. When you are doing a talk show, TV, radio, more so than columns, because nobody buys the newspaper specifically for a column. When you are doing that medium where you get graded, and you have been on there for 30 years, 30 years, and you essentially are still, from a ratings perspective and an advertising perspective and a fandom perspective, perspective, 
I think it's changed different things now, but still, love them or hate them. And you've been, in a, been on there that long and are still going strong. I mean, as Woody Allen said, half of doing a good job, 80% of it is making, your, making sure you show up every day. Mike has showed up every day for 30 years. Every day. He has showed up and listen. I have my lousy shows. He's had his lousy shows. I've had my issues at times. I get mad. I yell. I get you. I get mad at the calls. I, I you go ask Colin and Eddie. I can go crazy there. I have a report card. I'm competitive. The whole thing. I'm not happy sometimes when the show stinks. Same thing with Mike. But you know, you come the next day and hope the show's better. For 30 years, Mike has showed up, and whether it's in Astoria, Queens, or whether it's in Lower Manhattan. They have put that microphone on and that red light's gone on at one o'clock every day. I know he takes the summers off. You get the idea. 10 months. Every day for 30 years. And he has not been beaten. So there is to say. I, 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 don't know, I don't know how you can do any better than that. You've been on for three decades and you leave and you're still in first place. All right, the landscape's changed. Maybe it's not as much competition. It's more of a splintered radio thing now than it used to be. I buy that. I mean, so, you know, in, in, in my in, in our day, you know, you only could go to us, you only could go to the radio. Now you got so many other areas. So, you know, maybe you can finagle. The rating doesn't have to be as high. I, I, I don't know enough about the terrestrial radio, rating business right now, but all I know is more people listen to him, men, 25, 54, than anybody else in New York for the last 30 years. What else do you want to say? I, I, I don't, you know, if you win, if you're the, if you're a manager and you think Casey Stengel and you think he's been lucky, he's got all the good players, I'd win with DiMaggio and Mantle too, I got this, I got that, only one layer of playoffs, go on anything you want. Bottom line is he's been sitting here for 30 years and he's won. And again, you could, you know, in a lot of ways, it's it's weird because, you know, I feel part of it. You know, I was there two-thirds of the way. I feel part of it. And now radio stations, and I want to get to that in a second, and the media business has changed where you're not going to have that dominant personality or personalities in any town necessarily who are the home office for sports that is now over there's no more home office in new york city for sports talk no chance uh, you know uh, fan might be the home station but three to seven or two to seven or whatever they decide to do that's not the home office they got to prove that they're the home office and that is very very difficult to prove that you never want to be the show following the show. The coach following the coach. Ask Bill Benston following Lombardi. That is very hard. Now, Mike's Lombardi. That's all there is to it. All right. We all have our issues. Mike's nasty at times, mean at times, this at times, that at times. You know, uh, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. This is really about a salute more than anything else. It's a salute. And, you know, it's funny. I'll read it to you because it's nice. I called, you know, as you know, I called yesterday because, you know, Mike had a show yesterday where he had all the guests on, 83 or 85 guests. And uh, I, I was traveling uh, in Orlando. I had a uh, 320 plane after I did the TV. I didn't do the radio, as you know. So I, I had to, I mean, I had to figure out a way I had to get on, right? So I, I, I got on at um, 152 Eastern Time. And I, you know, when I we laughed, I said, what's next? How do you feel? You know, you're trying to get Mike to shed a tear, and that's not easy. Tony Russo was able to do it, but it's not that easy. Not easy. So I, you know, I called at 152, and we had some laughs. I could tell he was in a great mood. I think Mike is really looking forward to retirement. And here's what, uh, I, I, I got off the plane. It was late. I got in a car on the way home, 8 o'clock, 10 after 8. And I said, I texted him. And Mike and I text a lot. Don't talk. We text. That's Mike's way of communication. And you got to sometimes live on Mike's terms, which you learn how to do. And if you learn how to do it, he's going to give it right back to you. So I 
text that I said 